Hey folks, Glenn May here with BassResource.com and today I want to talk to you a little bit about fishing a river, fishing current. Uh, you know, today I'm on a huge body of water. This is the Columbia River out west. I like to fish it a lot. So I'm going to talk a lot about that. However, a lot of the principles I'm going to talk about here are applicable to smaller streams and rivers that are maybe in your neighborhood and where you like to fish. The first thing you need to take into consideration when it comes to river fishing is that current trumps everything. It is the primary thing that drives the, the, the fish, you know, where they're going to be positioned and their feeding activity. Uh, you know, on a, on a lake, Sure, there's water temperature, there's the weather conditions, there's the time of the year, etc. right? That's what drives the, fishing the fish behavior. That is applicable too on a river, but it's the current that drives everything. Let me, let me give you an example. I fished the John Day River a few years ago, and in the morning, it was early April, it's 25 degrees out in the morning. The water temperature was maybe 39 degrees. Typically, when you're fishing those conditions, you're looking for one or two bites for the entire day, and it might be a good fish, but it's gonna be slow fishing. Well, the three of us crushed them that day. I think we caught them all on, on fast-moving crankbaits, and we caught maybe 30 fish between the two of us, or the three of us, and I think the smallest fish was just a little under, under three pounds. Okay, so the current, the, the difference was, is that it had been raining a lot the week before, and there was a lot of current. It was pushing through that river really hard, so that, stirred up the activity, stripped the water, got the algae going, got the insects going, got the bait fish feeding on it, got the fish feeding. Uh, that trumped all the other conditions. So pay real close attention to that. And what I mean by that is current itself, well, let me talk a little bit about how it's gonna position fish. What you wanna do is look for current breaks. Anything that changes that flow of the current, that's where the fish typically are gonna set up on or could, or could set up on. You're looking for things like wing dams, points coming out in the water, you're looking for uh, bridge pilings, uh, you know, even logs and, and other, you know, uh, wood debris and things like that. Underwater, you're looking for humps, drop-offs, big rocks, boulders, that sort of thing that can break up that current. Even the channel bend, is it makes, if it does a real sharp turn, the outside of the bend is going to have faster moving current than the inside of the bend. The outside's going to be deeper water, the inside's going to be shallower water. Consequently, sometimes a lot of debris when it floods will stack up on those shallower inside bends and that can even block more current. What happens is the fish set up behind those current breaks where there's slack water eddies. They sit behind that and they wait for food to come by. Insects, bait fish, that sort of thing. And they'll dart out, out in the faster moving current to grab a bite and come back in in the, in the slack water. So what you're looking for is where that fast water meets the slower moving water. You'll see a ripple along the top of the water. We call that a seam. That's the prime zone. That's where the fish will set up on. That's where you want to make sure your lure goes. The stronger the current is, the more those fish are going to be positioned right directly behind those, those current breaks. And if it's really strong, they're going to snug up right behind it and maybe get a little bit deeper because that's where the slack water really is. Consequently, you know, conversely, if there's not a whole lot of current, then those fish will back off away from that current break. They may even sit up on top of it or even in the front of it sometimes. I've seen them do that. For example, in an island, they like to sit behind islands, but when the current is really slow, they'll, they'll come along the side and they'll come up on the front. Sometimes that can be a really good area. If there's really no current out and it's really slack, those fish may just go out into the, out in the main channel and suspend. Okay, there's not a lot of activity going on, so they're just not, the bite's going to be way off, even if the rest of the conditions are perfect. Again, current trumps everything. So how do you find these things? You want to find these current breaks, and you don't want to spend a whole lot of time running around on a river trying to find all this stuff. So first of all, what you want to do is get yourself a map. That's key to this. Get a map, then get another map, and then get another map. Get as many maps as you can of the body of water that you're going to fish. I've learned that uh, there's not any one map that has everything. Even the map on your GPS unit, they don't have everything on it. And you're looking for all those things that'll break up the, the uh, again, the current flow. One of the uh, maps that I really like to get is this one. It's a river cruising atlas. This is one in my local area that may have be a bit by a different name in your area, but this is for navigation. Okay, that's, you want to find a river for, a map for navigation. If you're on a river such as this one that's navigable, there's going to be a lot of great information on that, like where the buoys are and where the channel markers are, where the channels are, and I've 
noticed on a map like that, it'll tell you like where there are shipwrecks and things like that, right? So little nuggets of information. But again, every map has something different. Some will show more of the rock piles and show more wing dams and show more of the current, you know, the, the breaks and channels and the little eddies. Whereas another one may show you more where there's, uh, say, a field with a lot of stumps in it or, or a flat or a rocky bottom. They may talk about that or vegetation, where the weeds are. Every little bit, every map has a little bit different and that's gonna give you a bigger picture of the area that you're gonna fish. The other important part about that is you're gonna figure out where the channel is itself. Now, when you're on a river and you're not sure where everything is, being in the channel is really important, especially when you come off that channel, you need to know what's there, how shallow it is, what the bottom of the contour is, because you can lose a lower unit really quick. Okay, so pay close attention to that. If you're navigating in a water like this, when you're going upstream against the current, remember that the red markers, the red marker buoys, and the red channel markers are gonna be on your right-hand side. Red, right, returning. Think of that, returning, returning from the ocean. That's what it means, so you're going up against current. The green marker buoys and channel markers will be on your left-hand side. The other thing I want you to pay close attention to is if you're looking at your GPS and it's telling you where the channel marker is or where the channels are, and those marker buoys don't align to what your GPS is telling you, go by what the marker buoys are telling you. Okay, with, when these, these rivers, when they flood, sandbars move, they shift, the, the channel can shift and move, and your map may not be completely up to date. But the channel markers, they get moved around to, to adjust to that. I've, I've known some of my friends that have followed the channel markers or the channels that's on their GPS and they've had some damage to the lower units because the channel shifted or the markers, are the, it wasn't correct on the GPS. So pay close attention to those channel markers. So again, it's current, it's finding those current breaks. What you want to do now, once you've found those current breaks, how do you fish them? Go up, ideally, in a laboratory situation, you want to fish it. Uh, you want to get kind of, you want to move your boat, position it so it's going up against the current, cast your bait upstream, and let it drift across in the faster current through that seam that I told you about and into the eddy. Okay, that's perfect condition. You want that bait to go right across that seam so the bass can come up and nail it right there. Okay, so how I approach those on those, on those larger current breaks is I'll actually bring the boat up Behind the eddy, I'll slowly get to that area. I'll actually be in the faster moving current and I'll move, I'll, I'll, I'll slowly work my way into that eddy while I cast into that eddy. Because sometimes the fish will be in there and you can catch a few out of it before you, you stir it up and scare them by putting the boat right in the middle of that eddy. So work that eddy first. Then when you get into that current break, that's when you start throwing out into the faster moving water and bringing it right down that seam. And sometimes you can set up and you can catch fish all day long doing that, just on one spot if, the, if, it's, if the conditions are right. I like to fish islands, the back of islands, because then I can fish the seam on one side and when the bite dies down, I can shift the boat around and fish the seam on the other side. Once that bite down, dies down, I can go to the other side and pick right back up again, okay? The kind of baits that I like to throw, you can throw just about any bait in, that you use in the lakes, however, downsize a little bit. I don't know what it is with rivers, but the big, huge baits don't do as well. If you're used to throwing three quarter ounce spinner baits, downsize to half ounce. If you're using half ounce all the time, downsize to three eighths or quarter ounce. Same thing with your crankbaits. Downsize a little bit, and with your plastics, instead of throwing six inch and seven inch lizards, go down to a four inch. Go down to a, a three inch tube. A tube is my favorite. Okay, I absolutely love throwing tubes on this body of water or any river, because that does two things. That mimics the bait fish and also crawfish. And that's, that's what's abundant in these type of river systems. That's what the fish are biting on the most. So the tube is one of the most versatile baits you can use in a big river like this. As for color, I like to throw white. My white crankbaits, white spinnerbaits, anything that mimics bait fish, perch color. Uh, and uh, sometimes I'll throw black if the, if the conditions are right. Not very often, but black works as far as plastic. Green pumpkin works really well. Um, that's your mainstay, it's a bread and butter. One thing you got to think about is just because you're downsizing doesn't mean you downsize on the weight. You've got to go up in the weight to make sure that you can compensate for the current. So I may be fishing little three inch tubes, but in, when I, if I put it on a split shot, for example, instead of using uh, an eighth ounce or a one thirty second ounce or a one sixteenth ounce weight that I normally do when I split shot, now I'm using more like a quarter ounce to a half ounce weight. I might even go up to a three quarter ounce if the current's really strong. And you might be thinking, well, heck, if you're going that heavy, why not use a Carolina rig? It's for the simple fact that a Carolina rig has so many components to it, it can get hung up on the bottom. 
Okay, you're gonna get hung up anyways, but you'll get hung up less using the cylindrical weight that I use for Mojo Rig and Split Shot Rig. Same with my, my, uh, my, my two baits. I use a heavier jig head in it. Just keep in mind, you gotta bring a lot of your terminal tackle with you because you are gonna get snagged on the bottom. You are gonna get hung up. That's just the nature of doing it. I usually rig two different ways. I have some rods that have a lighter weight and other rods that have a heavier weight because in, where, where the river opens up like this, you're not gonna have a stronger current and where it narrows down, you're gonna have stronger current. So I wanna have the two different weights so I can fish those very effectively without having to re-rig every time I, I change position. Anyway, I hope those help. I can go on and on and on with all the different ways you can fish river. If you have any questions, please leave a comment down below. I'll be happy to try to answer them. I do read all those comments. And for the answers to all your questions about bass fishing, visit BassResource.com. Hey, if you like this video, give us a thumbs up and leave a comment below. And if you want to watch more videos like this, click one of the images on your screen right now. Thanks for watching, and don't forget to subscribe.